lost magic. When an hour of Harley's growls through Skagit County for the oyster run, every earring, lip ring, nipple ring pulls its patch of flesh forward. Magnets draw the body down to Highway 9 or onto the porch with a cat named Grandma. Meanwhile, in the living room, Boeing's newest jet stuck up near the roof of sound. The family believes in apocalyptic beards without smiles or names or gasoline. Where I come from. When there was a narrative, I was still a boy, catching all the meanings my adults could hint. But who were you, inventors of the story? Which constellations did you interpret to devolve a job of work? In blood-smeared robe, a meat axe in hand, the butcher smiles across the counter. A mound of coin shimmers at dawn. She empties a black frilled, black frilled apron on the kitchen table. Turquoise car to the exotic sea, warm and away from here, top-down cruiser, radio on Sinatra. Lapping sea in weeds where current skims high flood below a bridge, naiads or nymphs whose crab pots would mount the walls of Ilium and this tawdry fish stank porch, sons and daughters of lobstermen swim there in the noon sun, in iodine, in hope. What studs the rush tide made them dive to be? Did you ever know better? In the sweat, in the sea of sweat, workers and co-workers, class of the broad vowel and stepped on phoneme, hang on sacks of grain, a broken loose cargo wrapped in human sinew and tattoo of prole art running up her ankle and calf. Vein and coil along her thigh, scroll work of an indolent scribbler who knew all about toil and embroidered our flesh before sending us off to sea. Dark home under the soil. In one hour, this city, and the subway is Arachne, feverishly threads the heart, a severed obstacle. Stuck in transit, we leer at the bodies of the others. A mad woman spits tobacco juice in your face. She's carried 20 miles away in 10 minutes. Days pass like gum into the ground when a body fell. High windows overlook the city, a spark with a plane's empty window seat. Two working men shout their life stories. The stenographer with beaded chain dangling eyeglasses forgoes the evening paper, gets it all down. No detail falls to unrecorded time. All didactic, we head south across the river, rented sails and afternoon humidity. Hung from chrome subway bars, they tell the train simple truths of child rearing. Their sons scuttle on spongy sea legs, elbows out, larger girth, shy but equal to the talk. TV commercials, the template for advice, bright green shirt, smudged knee. A woman, once lovely, once everybody's baby doll, fights over money with her daughter, nine years old. Shut up, this is fair. No, it's not. The humility it takes, or lack of self-effacement, not to hide, you always abuse her, distinguishes one class from another. And that other line, on that other line, air conditioning always works. Swelter of June, the poor ride hot, and they are loud venture anywhere, ask anything indiscreet, impersonal, they give you the thoroughly smug. Across the rocking, two salesmen smoke on the breath, a black man missing two front teeth and tie and starch, white mentor, cigarette tucked neat behind his ear, greased hair. We're figuring it out. In our proper suits, we go to school. What you have, that's for me. What I have, it's off Mass Ave. And I'll read this last poem, um, which I think uh, ties into that same autobiographical mode. It's called Turning Point. 
you want to remember yourself beside that wall of glass where you repaired the windows rocks and bottles sailed through and a riot of gales funneled off the strait of Juan de Fuca in roaring white caps and orca roll, the cat calm in your hands and try to recall what that young pharmacist saw. You, in your search, tormented the way you were, perhaps for the cat who threw himself against your door where cedar and fir hung over the bluff, former party house for outcast town boys. Their farewell, rotted watermelon and beer cans crushed on the pine floor. A cat you named for the phony mythic Celt Wishon, an epic some Scott made up to flummox scholars. The cat, the first year pharmacist who covered his grin, diagnosed, unseen, a prolapse rectum, runaway manx, bear of shielding tail from the Isle of Man. Have a look at yourself at a window onto an indescribable sunset leaked throughout the copper sea, on a cozy chair you carted off from the dump, in the palm of your hand smeared thick with preparation H, sits wish on, uncomplaining, calm, the H burn shrinking, the red boil of his baboon ass. There's no polite description the hitchhiker somewhere out west told me in the car owned by the woman I was leaving. No polite way. The barrel of that pistol in my mouth, you know what it feels like to know who you are. From the passenger seat, he saw who I was, the one who dropped him at the intersection, drove home in her car, and slipped away. Michael, you're muted. I was just about to say that. You're muted. Unmute yourself, Michael. Is that okay? Now can I can you? hear you. So we missed what you were saying or reading. So if you could do that over <laughs> a little bit. I wonder how far back I muted. Okay. I'll just start here. A, just about she a dropped him. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. No, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> dropped a hitchhiker off. That's what I was saying. I remember. Yeah, Boom. I remember about okay. Okay, I'll start with a sentence here. When I walked back to thank the laughing pharmacist, died last night, my friend said his withered employer, yellowed nicotine fingers mixing meds for the nursing home. All alone in that cold apartment, I knew he had a bad ticker. That old man, grieving in the open, counting out pills. You carve out a hole in flesh and find no mystery. From there, I went on a drunk in New York, smoked a few packs a day, yelled at trumpeters and drummers on the jazz stage, wandered lonely as a cloud to the basement men's room without a match from my smoke. Angry growls blew from a half-open stall. His left hand straight out gripped the throat of a frightened white boy, then silence as he turns slowly. I hold up my camel. He locks onto my drunk eyes. His right hand gracefully lifts the gold lighter, a flame. The left pins the kid, eyes never leaving mine. Look here, don't look at him, don't look away. Mouth a grim certainty. Pools of eyes, just readable. I see you. I know the nothing and everything you are. And thank you. <laughs> never done this zoom thing before <laughs> it is very weird to get used to i didn't know how to unmute you when you went mute so <laughs> yeah, my, my fingers jumped onto the laptop here <laughs> thank you michael thank um you. our next reader is andrew stancheck and he's going to be reading from his manuscript called somersaults and i'm very excited to uh, hear you andrew so i give you andrew well, hello everybody. Uh, I'm excited to be here. Thanks Gloria for inviting me. Thanks for Chirvena Barva Press. Congratulations to you. And thank you to all my, my friends. And um, I will 
reviews three pieces today. And uh, the first one is called The Sting on the Skin. And it was published by uh, New World Writing uh, editor Kim Chinkwe. The day after my 13th birthday, chunks of ice bounced off the roofs, off the cars, off the sidewalk, and I watched overjoyed with the world. When I ran past empty thorn bushes to share my joy, I saw dad walking up to our front door, talking to himself, pointing a forefinger at our car and at the door, chuckling. And for a second, I thought his excitement was about the hail. Isn't it grand, dad, I said. The plunk, the bounce, the sting on the skin. But he kept walking and saying, pow. He'd been out of work for three months. And I realize now that he and mom were shrouded by an unseeing fog. I followed him into the kitchen. Easiest thing in the world, Evie, he said to mom. No idea why I didn't think of it earlier. All I had to do was put on my Al Capone, Al Capone scowl, tell him I have a gun, and he handed over all the bills in the cash register. Look at all this money, Evie. We're rich. And when this runs out, why, I'll just go to another town and get us more. Mom was shaking her head, wiping flour off her hands, and I realized she was as stunned as I was. He threw a cascade of bills into the air, beaming, and I had a sense that my life would never be the same. When he grinned at her and pointed his finger at me, I could tell he wanted us to say that he'd done well. Mom's face crunched, but her eyes focused at a point just above his ear, as if a dark moth were hovering around. The oven crackled with roasting chicken, seeping that crisp smell of sizzling skin and warm sage in the dressing. Then Mum's mouth opened wide and she wailed. The noise went on and on and Dad looked at her with manic eyes. Time speeded up, or as it slowed down. In seconds, the front of our house pulsed with police cars and every car siren was blaring and its lights flashing. Mum's wail was as loud as the sirens and burly men poured in with guns drawn. Mum and I held our hands up, way up, and Dad rolled on the ground, bloodied and handcuffed. He was never free again. Soon he was moved to the asylum for observation. For two weeks, I went to school as if nothing had changed. Once Mum visited Dad, she said they would not let me in. He's pumped with tranquilizers, Sam, and he wouldn't know you. It's like a coma. And one day I found her at the kitchen table, her head in shaking hands, and I knew he was dead. She had blue dark circles around her eyes, and over the next few weeks, told me about seven times every night that we'd be fine, just fine. I stayed in bed and ate dry cereal, and read the encyclopedia articles from the set that Dad had bought. I began with the article on Aardvark and read every entry in order. One evening, she shook herself like a sheepdog coming out of the rain and said, we have no choice, and we moved to Grandma's. I stopped trying to figure that out, and I thought about baseball and girls and going off with a swim team. When I went away to college, Mom married Fred Voita. I didn't see her for years. I determined that neither my father nor she would be a part of my new life. I printed resolutions onto cardboard, which I pasted above my desk. The first read, always look to the future. The second was, family is past. The other day I realized I've been seeing Stella for over a year and no longer felt bound to my cardboard resolutions. I was telling her again about the day of the robbery and told her, you get used to anything, even to your father being a failed robber and dying in an asylum. Since Stella told me that I'd be a father soon, I've been pondering that man who looked through me, who promised to teach me to hit a ball but was always too bush, who never joined me in the backyard when I was looking at the stars, the man who pointed a gun at a store clerk and died alone. I walked barefoot through morning dew on my uncut lawn one Thursday, and I thought, why, 
It was the hail. The hail that day, that day made him do it. I chuckled at the lovely simplicity of that answer. I called and made a date with mom. We sat together in her quiet sunroom. We sipped sweet sherry and I said, mom, I'm getting married just ahead of the baby. She laughed. Her hair was lighter now and laughter came to her easily. She said, well, that's good timing, Sam. I do hope you'll be happy. She asked about Stella's family and we crunched pretzel sticks. Sooner or later, I knew we'd talk about dad. When she moved forward, she said, your father was ill, Sam. Something in his brain, an aneurysm or a, or a node or something burst. He believed in order and cause and effect and logical explanations. Being out of work was a dead end, a broken line. Someone had to make amends, he told me. And then his brain exploded. It was a theory that made her comfortable. She convinced herself of this the same way that she convinced herself that garlic will ward off the cold. The other alternative was less palatable. She might have to acknowledge that she lived for many years with a man who lacked a conscience. Mum embraced a rational explanation of dad's irrational behavior, and I was leaning towards the mysterious. Dad died, but we both concluded that it didn't matter very much. It was the past, and we were eager to look to the future, to exposing our faces to hail, to soaring, to screeching seagulls. I refilled our glasses. Let's have a toast, Mum, I said. Two happy children. Um, this is a very short piece, which was published originally in Tin House. It's called Smell of Water. Alexei cannot lift his feet. He shuffled from door to door for 51 days handed out 347 resumes, been shown the door 183 times. He believes that keeping track is therapeutic. 516 days since he last sang in public, 416 days since the birthday celebration, the fireworks, the explosion that punctured his eardrums and seared his face. 43 days for the insurance to be exhausted and his release from the hospital. 309 days, since Natasha last smiled. His face is what scares them off. If the insurance had paid for a skin graft, someone might have offered him a crumb, but Alexei stopped doing if only a long time ago. He thinks a list of all the opera houses where he sang will be a good memory exercise. If he concentrates, he might be able to put a number on the length of the ovations. He used to count steps, but it's too easy to lose track and he lost faith. No point in doing it if it's not going to be accurate. He can't sing anymore. He can't hear. He can't do physical labor. He can't be seen in public. Savings gone. Friends like leaves off a tree. Their birdcage used to be full of squawks and whistles, but the only time the perches swing now is when Natasha bumps the cage while dusting. And the newspapers at the bottom are always clean. Soup lasts the longest. They still have one box of bird seed in the awning cupboards. He's glad the cat died of old age before they had to. He's sure it would have been stringy. The city was, was once home for flocks of pigeons, but he hasn't seen one in months. The parks are filled with searchers. Some still have homes, most sleep on the benches. He's heard screams in the night, stories of human bones being buried. He used to miss the wine. In the old days, he toured the Loire Valley more than once, tasting. Now the memory is faint, a smell more than a taste. His smell has become more acute since he lost the hearing. He smells water, moves towards it through an oddly familiar part of town. His head is light and resounds with the flapping of wings. Exhilarated, 
He watches a flock of geese flying low over a bridge, chattering, urging him on. He's light and weightless. He hops on the bridge, spreads his wings, and joins their formation. And this last piece is called Cleansing, and that's part of a suite that, that I have of um, grief pieces. Cleansing. We are laughing so hard that her shaking arm knocks off her glasses and snot smears her cheek and she begins a body racking cough and I expect a nurse to give me the evil eye. Then she stops and says, it's not even funny, Adam, and bursts out in, bursts out in laughter again. It isn't, damn it. I've peed myself. That's not funny either. A man in my 60s with incontinence issues. Does the support group meet in the hospital cafeteria, I wonder, close to the bathrooms? I brought glitter and hair color and feathers and squeegees. And when I started pulling them out of the bag and putting them on her bed, she pointed and said, you. And for her, I'll tell jokes and do pratfalls and even transform myself into a drag queen. So I spray a wild purple streak on one side and glitter all down the other based on enormous eyelashes, geyser some strands of hair straight up. I slide huge angel wings over my shoulders, flap, jump, don't take off, I stagger, and then we are beside ourselves. It was in remission for over a year. Now we're counting days, hours, minutes. Yesterday for three hours, she never opened her eyes, wove in and out of sleep, and I watched her chest moving gingerly up and down. Get me a beer, she rasps. I pop the tab, pour half into a Kennedy cup, hold a flexible straw to her lips. One swallow. She cannot force down anymore. Even liquids are hard. No, it's not funny. I flap a wing. She forces a smile. Her small table holds her worn Bible, rosary beads, a small prayer card of cuddle votia, half a tangerine. A parish priest must have visited. I doubt she has used rosary beads in 40 years, but I don't remove them. Gold glitter flutters onto my pants. Is my second act going to be dropping plates and colored balls? Or is it curtains? She may have just received last rites, cleansed her soul with a good confession, but I don't ask. She may not remember. At Thanksgiving, she told me that she's giving serious thought to getting married again. Lots of gray-haired bucks in the neighborhood. She'd enjoy the company. I dropped my teacup, busied myself picking up the shards. A week later, she had a fall. Her lips are moving now, but no words are audible. Could be prayer or curses or demand for more beer. I don't ask her to speak up and the movement stops. I massage mentholy cream into the black blotches and bruises on her sagging skin. Outside her window, small visitors chitter, looking for feed from her outstretched arm. She closes her eyes. I take deep breaths and listen. Her clear voice says, I will see you later. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you, uh, Michael, also, and Andrew for reading. And thank you, everyone, for being here to help us celebrate. And I just have a few announcements before I let you all go. And tomorrow is going to be a double reading, actually. Um, on Facebook Live, um, you can hear Annie Pluto and Hilary Salek read from 6 to 6.30, 
So if you go to live video and then look, scroll down to you, find Tip City Public Library and click on that, you'll be able to hear them. And uh, the second reading is at seven o'clock and it's Ed Miller and Noel Sloboda and it's seven Eastern time, four o'clock Pacific. So I hope to see some of you there for that. And again, you know, thank you so much for being here. And again, Andrew and Michael, thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So I guess that's it. So um, I will end this. And